people here uh, working on Coronivia since we've been working here already a long week. But it's actually Saturday, Saturday evening. So I think it's great to see different people here in the room still at this hour in the weekend. So I think that's very nice to see. So thank you all again for being here. Um, Today we have a session here in the Benelux Pavilion, hosted by the FAO together with the Netherlands. Um, and the topic will be, of course, the Coronivia Joint Work on Agriculture. Uh, I think all of you will know that since you're in this, in this room at this moment. Um, I'm Lucas Dupré, I'm from the Netherlands, uh, and I also do the Coronivia work on behalf of the Netherlands. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here for me as well. It's my first COP working on Coronivia, so a lot of new insights for me. And, um, and I'm also still learning, so very curious to see also the different interventions that we will have with us tonight. Um, to open this meeting, I would very much like to introduce to all of you our first speaker, which is Mr. Zituni Uldada, um, Deputy Director uh, of the Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment at the FAO. Uh, Zituni, can I invite you to stage? And the floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much, Lucas, and um, good evening, everyone. It's nice to see again the Coronivia family. I think we met in various settings. Um, I don't have much to say except, first of all, to really appreciate, you know, what we all been working on um, on driving this Coronivia agenda forward. Looking at the big picture, what's been happening in the negotiations and also the fact that we are looking to transform agri-food systems to make them more efficient, sustainable, and resilient to the climate change. Perhaps in your, in your environment in Coronivia, you may not realize that, but you did actually help raise the profile of agriculture in the UNFCCC. Sea. It's the only specific agenda really in the climate change and because of that it really built that foundation that others came in to actually start talking more about food and agriculture and what you see today now in cop 26 is a huge difference to what happened in previous cops is the first cop actually where you see a lot of space for food and agriculture and the recognition beyond Coronivia that agri-food systems are a critical part of the solution to the climate crisis, biodiversity loss and sustainable development in general. So really it's something you know you should be very proud of and we definitely appreciate this, especially that we've been with you of course all along providing the space for you to prepare more and, and to come to, um, to, to the COP. And in this agenda also in FAO, we've been supporting particularly women experts in agriculture. Uh, and we supported six of them to come in and voice you know, their needs and concerns, particularly from, from rural areas, but more importantly, to, to take part in this process and, and voice their, um, their concerns. Um, I think all the workshops and the submissions that were made, obviously, they really helped to raise this agenda uh, as part of the overall uh, objective of ensuring global food security. So the, the last thing I want to, to say really is, um, as I mentioned to, in the introduction, because we are in this um, journey of transforming agri-food systems. I see the Coronivia really as an important contributor to designing the transformation and a design in the sustainable and climate resilient agriculture as it was captured in the draft conclusions of, of the Coronivia. And also really try to influence the long-term investment in agriculture I think all the areas you have in, in, in the Coronivia, soil, water management, manure management, livestock, um, food security dimensions, all these, of course, they are important elements of this transformation. And, and really would be good, obviously, 
you know, for this to materialize through, through the Cornelia. I think in this context, um, there are a number of constituted bodies, obviously, as you know, within the framework, the UNFCCC framework. And it's important, I think, that the Coronivia also builds those connections with the constituted bodies, including the Finance Committee um, and others, you know, in, in relation to building capacity, uh, but also loss and damage. They, they, they are all interconnected, and you cannot have the transformation, and you cannot have Coronivia joint work on agriculture being part of that without making those connections. So the creating these interlinkages. Um, and the aim is really to help us enhance the action we're looking for and also improving the implementation of the Coronivia. So this is really my, my last message and I just want to, on behalf of FAO and especially our director is here um, of the Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment, Eduardo Mansour. Um, he's, he's witnessing now the spirit of the Coronivia and how we've been going with you and following you on this. And I'd like to thank Martial, obviously you all know him, who's been really working with you on this and the whole team behind. Um, and I really wish you, you know, a, a very good discussion and a good continuation going forward to COP27 and beyond. But we're here to support you and to be with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Setuni, uh, for these opening remarks. It is very great to see how you again mentioned the role also of all of us in raising the profile of agriculture in relation to climate change. So thank you very much. Um, that gives me the opportunity to open the floor to our second speaker, which is Martial Bernou. Um, Martial Bernou, all of us know him, I guess, uh, but he is a senior officer of the natural uh, of natural resources at FAO. And he's been also, of course, leading uh, the work on, on the Coronivia Joint Work on Agriculture. Uh, so, Marcel, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It's fine. Okay. I will not be long. Huh? It's not uh, if you're short tonight. Huh? <laughs> so, uh, I will just be brief to just remember for people that do not are aware of what is Coronivia, what it is. But I can see uh, I recognize a lot of friends of the extended Corinivia family, so most of you but are aware, but we have also people that are not aware and we have people online. So really briefly, and I, perhaps I can use that. Okay. Uh, so just to remember, what is Corinivia? And I will not read, but just to say this is just one page. But the most important page you ever had in that space in UNFCC, allowing to discuss on issues related to agriculture, resilient agriculture, and food security dimension. Negotiator has adopted a roadmap you can see here, uh, here. And basically, we are here. Report to COP26 on the progress made. Well, we have a report. Huh? It's not the report of the process, it's the report of the session. This is quite different. The report of that report is postponed a little bit, but it will happen. So we still have plenty of room to discuss. So this is something perhaps I will be back. Who is involved in the process? So all here people in the room, mostly a lot of negotiators I can recognize. So countries, bodies also, the different bodies, and the different bodies perhaps just to put there are all those bodies. So the Tuni were mentioning some, so but there was plenty of bodies, financial mechanism, financial entities, GF, uh, GCF. And we have observers that are in the room, and we have constituency. So we have uh, if you are a recognized farmer, a constituency, <laughs> I <carries. laughs> uh, and, and we have financial mechanism also uh, in the process. So just to go briefly, but then what next, I would say, because the process is not ended. And depending on the impact the country, the negotiator want to have, or the level of ambition they want to have, they, they will have to address, or they can address, if they wish so, or they can activate different building blocks that you have here. 
So they can discuss, recognize the work done because they did quite a lot of work, sometime late during the night or early in the morning. They can discuss future topics. They can move more on technical priorities to be addressed on the uh, substar or move on the more the SBI side on how to implement within the convention agriculture more strongly. So to that, we, we draft a small paper trying to put the different uh, building blocks that are uh, existing. This is the web page where you can find a lot of information we are trying to, to offer to, to all people uh, interested in the process for them to understand. And perhaps if we can project the small video right now. So this is our donor that are also supporting uh, why we are here, our team, because it's not just me. Uh, it's a, a, a lot of uh, young person, very uh, motivated. And now you will see, you have sound normally. But at the same time, it is estimated that our food systems could be responsible for a third of global greenhouse gas emissions. Established under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in 2017, Coralinia Joint Work on Agriculture officially acknowledges the unique role that agriculture can play in tackling climate change. This work has brought UNFCCC parties from around the world together to discuss a number of areas related to agriculture, climate change, and food security. As we approach the end of the Coronavirus Roadmap, a report on the outcomes of this work is due to be presented at the United Nations Climate Change Conference. Although it is difficult to predict the outcomes of coronavirus discussions, it is possible to identify five categories that could offer various combinations or pathways for action. Parties could identify technical priorities of work where there is consensus, or they could determine institutional modalities for their implementation under the convention. They could extend the roadmap to discuss present or new topics. Recognize the work performed so far or coronavirus joint work on agriculture could be made dormant with no agreement reached. Not all of these possibilities demonstrate the same level of ambition or effort. Coronavirus will only be a true success once all these dimensions are addressed and concrete action is taken. Achieving a more sustainable, resilient, and food secure agriculture in the face of a worsening climate crisis will take time. However, the end of the Coronavirus Roadmap provides a unique opportunity to take an important step towards meaningful change. So, we have seen the five options. I let you decide where we are. <laughs> But fortunately, we have the negotiator in the room, so they will say to you, what next? So I will thank you so much, and I will end my, my speech here. Thank you. The conclusion. Thank you very much, Martial. That was a great information again about what we have to do, what we, what we should have done here in Glasgow, what we're going to do. Uh, moving towards uh, the bond session, which is uh, next year and afterwards the next COP, of course. Um, thank you very much. That brings us to the second part of this site event, and that is actually that we will share some information from uh, the negotiators who have been with us all week negotiating on Coronivia. Um, and it's uh, a pleasure for me to firstly invite Valérie Dermot to the stage. Thank you very much, Valérie. Um, there are two questions which four uh, panelists people will address. The first question will be, what are lessons learned from the Coronivia Joint Work on Agriculture in session, from in-session workshop and the submissions? And the second question will be, what are the outcomes of Coronivia in Glasgow? Or what should they be if we look to the future? Um, and what is also missing, according to you, to the outcomes that we have had so far? Thank you very much. And Valérie, the floor is yours. Yes, 
Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so lessons learned. Yeah, maybe we all have different point of view, but um, first it may seem very um, uninteresting, but I think that we learned that the, the process, the framing of the process is, is very interesting, is very important because uh, before Coronivia we had workshop and uh, during Coronivia we had workshop, but the difference is in uh, in Coronivia, we also had what we called a consideration phase. So it means when we have a workshop, then we have a report, and then we have time dedicated to discuss the, the workshop report. And it allowed us to have some, uh, some outcomes that we didn't have in the past. So first, the framing, I think it's really important. And maybe we could even go further um, in, in the future if we go on and have even more structured, maybe consideration phase to, to allow um, some maybe practical ex exchanges or voilà. Um, then I think lesson learned, we, we learned that a lot is already done. We knew it, but we all knew part of it, and then it allowed constituted bodies, financial, financial entities, parties to, to, to have a bit more the global view. It's not easy to have the, the global view, but a more global view on what is done, and a lot is done, and we can see that there are many people that have really a good will to do a lot. Um, but uh, for example, we, we learned recently that uh, only a very, very small amount of, of uh, the money that is going to agriculture finance, finance going, going to climate agriculture is going to small scale farmers. So maybe uh, it's not really linked to the number of people they represent. So. Um, we, we thought that maybe uh, there could be a need to coordinate the work of the constituted bodies um, on, uh, on how it is spent, also on the technical content, because uh, everybody has his way, its way to, uh, to monitor uh, the, the emissions, so the adaptation, the money that goes to um, adaptation mitigation, um, and uh, everybody has his technical priorities also, so maybe Coronivia or another, another name for the future could be also a place to have something harmonized, discussed, validated under the UNFCCC, of course with the FAO and uh, all the technical support that we get, and it could be maybe something more coherent. coherent. Um, and uh, the outcomes of Glasgow, I think we we can be quite proud because it's the first time we have really technical content. We had some technical content from the consideration phase of the report on the soil and on the evaluation of adaptation, but it was really one sentence. And this time we go really further. And um, what lesson learned also is also that the more we go, the more it looks like the vision is, is a converging, the vision between everybody, the different parties and the financial entities and uh, even, um, even uh, actors outside the UNFCCC, it seems like uh, the synergies between mitigation and adaptation seem to be even if the names are not given, mitigation, voila, it's something uh, during during the negotiation, uh, everybody has a position. Even if, the, if the, the names are not said, it seems that we are going a bit to that. Also, the, um, especially here this year with the nature being um, really a, a central topic for the UK, it seems that the convergence between climate and biodiversity is really... Um, becoming like a mainstream, the, um, so, so that's really important because it leads to different technical uh, priorities also um, bit by bit. And um, what should or could be the outcome? Um, we have some technical uh, outcome now, but they are just, we noted that, we noted that. For example, we have very good things on uh, the optimal use of nutrient, uh, organic fertilizer. We have, uh, of course, many stuff on the vulnerability of uh, agriculture and livestock to climate change. Many stuff also on uh, the national circumstances, the context-specified uh, uh, priorities, etc. 
many things also on um, on um, on the mitigation on the global uh, aiming to reduce emission in livestock for example ending hunger etc so the systematic approach also inclusive approaches so many stuff that we could build on and um, what we could do, could but I don't know. It's also it's always party driven, etc. Everybody has uh, his his view. But maybe we could carry on these and, for example, uh, ask uh, to the to the constituted bodies and financial entities to to take them into account in the work program. It could be a way, or they, there could be new ways also to to think, and it could be viewed. Uh, viewed a bit like uh, non-regret options or recommendations or a bit even like safeguards some principles that could be uh, really um, like um, the bottom line of each project uh, in the future so we could we could do many things and um, it seems that uh, this week the, the spirit was really um, constructive, positive, and um, it was quite fluid, the, the negotiation. So maybe it can give us hope for the future. Uh, one more question. Um, you mentioned a positive spirit we had the last couple of days, um, and also some very nice outcomes we've had. Um, looking forward to Bonn and also to Egypt where the next COP will be hosted. Um, what are your expectations on the progress we will make over there? Um, I think we still need lots of work because we, we had uh, three Mondays to do this week and we only finished nearly one of them not totally <laughs> but uh, it was constructive it's better to do only one but to do it quite well maybe so we need some really some time to discuss uh, the future ways because we learn also that each party has its, its view so maybe we can uh, ask the, the FAO uh, to to help us and uh, give us space to talk to exchange on the on the future on the, the reporting back of the whole process and the future, it, it could be uh, really interesting. So yeah, how, how to carry this technical content, how to use it the best, and uh, what, what could be useful for, for the future. And um, if I may, for, for example, there is one, one topic that is always uh, risen up. And uh, for now, uh, there is not a common view. Uh, so I don't speak in the name of... Uh, uh, European Union, but just in the name of France, we are um, quite involved in agroecology, and uh, the, the term has been used many, many times in the workshops, in the workshop reports, and uh, we know that uh, there are many parties that have different views. So maybe the, the FAO could help us to really have a common understanding on the different concepts there, 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 are, there, are, there, are, there is a, a regenerative agriculture, nature-based solution, climate-smart agriculture. If we could share at least the same view, maybe at the end we could have the same, uh, the same direction because sometimes we seem to have di different uh, <laughs> directions, but it's just that we don't use the same word. It can happen, so that could maybe help. Thank you very much, Valérie. Um, that brings me to the next step, and that is for me to invite a second speaker to the floor. Um, it's my pleasure to present to you Mrs. Carla Menasota. Uh, Carla is a negotiator on Coronivia from Costa Rica, and Carla is also a representative of PLACA, and PLACA is the platform of Latin America and the Caribbean for climate action on agriculture. Thank you very much, Carla. You hear me? Yes, good. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It is my, my pleasure to be here and the Coronivia family. This is great for me and of course for Costa Rica to be part of that, of that great um, family with a big issue that we have, I think is agriculture need to be in this climate, climate change convention forever. I know it's ambition, but if we obtain the, you know, the, 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 
the white black to be here, we need to take care. We need to work together. Like uh, my colleague explained a little bit, how is that dynamic of that sessions? I know we, I don't, I don't want to repeat, you know, that he, she said because most of you know. This is interesting. I, I will share with you my point of view, like a Carla, Costa Rica, because for us it was really interesting, and I will like to exchange, uh, share, share with you our experience. Me, I, I work with the Minister of Agriculture and Livestock in Costa Rica, and we decide to be part of Coronivia like a Minister of Agriculture and Livestock three years ago. I think this is a first lesson learning that I want to share with you. We need to be part of our agriculture and livestock public policy in our countries in order to make sense that the decisions that I work that, that we talk here in order to back to our countries to work in congruent, you know, actions, because it's so important also the communication in the public policy, because it's a big challenge, you know, environmental and agriculture ministers or sectors has a big challenge in our country. Like uh, he explained, I, I'm the co-president of PLACA in Latin American and Caribbean countries. And this is a big issue over there. I can't imagine how the issue in the whole world is, you know, so um, another thing really important, of course, when we start in Coronivia family, like a Minister of Agriculture and Livestock, remind me the process in my country. I know it's a small country, but it's a big, we have a big heart in agriculture to improve lessons, to improve knowledge, to improve technology, scientists, data. Um, Costa Rica start with this. Costa Rica is engaged with the agriculture and livestock in sustainable way since many years ago. We, uh, we work together with our producers in order to be sustainable in many activities. I wish I will mention just five. Livestock, coffee is so famous in my country, <laughs> rice, sugar cane and bananas. We already start to work with, in, with, with the producer with that, um, in that um, topics because in the economic way they represent uh, a lot of um, income and exportation for us. So this is so important to work. The first of all, of course, we have many crops in a tropical country, but to start to work with them in the same line that Coronivias is going on. For me, when, when I hear, when I learn about how is Coronivia in the line was so familiar because we are working with them in mitigation, adaptation, soil, livestock, water, socioeconomy dimensions are so important. I always say, if we are working in agriculture, we are working with people, farmers, women and men, don't forget it. If you are here in that, they can imagine this, of course, but we need to think how to implement that things, how to explain to the producers, because at the end it's for them. It's difficult. For that reason, we need to be together. We need to be here because there are many policy um, that change a lot. And also, Minister of Agriculture in our countries need to establish a road. In Costa Rica, we decide to have a national strategy in low carbon products with that crops that I told you and livestock too, in order to try to implement actions in soils, in inventory, uh, greenhouses inventory. And, and another thing really important here is the future of Coronivia. So make me sense to me the future of our national strategy, how to scale, maybe in a big dimension, you know, but I think, um, I don't know if I can answer the next question. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I think for the future of Coronivia, uh, because it's my, my, it's my poem of you, and with all my respect, I, I have some comments that I, I write for you. Um, we need to scale. Worship is all right. 
do you know most of you, you know, uh, discuss about this? Like uh, Marshall explained us to us. So, but we need to we need to scale. We need to uh, to to think about maybe it's not the world. I hope we are not in negotiation now. <laughs> this is a big challenge too. How to talk? What kind of work we need to say in order in order that the different regions in the world can understand the same? This is a big mistake, a big a big issue, because sometimes we can make mistake and it's not you know our fault. Maybe sometimes we understand different, and this is a big challenge. But it's nice. It's nice to to understand this. So. To the next step, um, in my point of view, I repeat it. <laughs> we need, or uh, I think, we need to have a plan of implementation, like a maybe we call like a program or work or pl work plan or um, like a, to to uh, to catalyze the implementation of actions. This is so important. I think we know. Like my colleague said, we have many things talking about different strategies, but now we need to do it. We need to implement awareness to our farmers now. We need to start to work with our farmers in the line of Coronivias. I don't know if every country here in Coronivias family work with the producers in soil matters, in livestock matters like we, we talk. It's a big issue. It's not, it's not, um, it's not easy to start. We have more than 10 years tried to work in that line, and we are step by step. And also catalyze financial resources to reduce the vulnerability. We need to go address on it now, because it's an urgent action, you see? We start to change and talk. We are technique, well, I am technique, te te techniques and expert in agriculture. But we need to transform the workshops results in actions and to, fi to finish, of course, we are agreed to promote scientific discussions, but base it on um, real situations of exper experience, because this is this is the essence also of Coronivia to take decisions based in our experience. I know we need to go in that line. Uh, of course, promoted development international cooperation. This is so important. It's not what, it's how. We need to decide how, and of course, to contrib con contribute to build resilience at the farm level. My apologize because my, my, uh, my, um, my hat is extension service. We need to work together with the farmers. We need to work in that resilience with them, with that um, scientific knowledge traduced for their language. We need to work in, in financial resources, catalyze in order to work with directly with the ministers of agriculture and livestock, because we want to implement directly that funds to the farmers. Sorry, we don't want actors in the middle, you know? Because sometimes the funds pass, pass for many, many uh, institutions. And at the end, what is the, the benefits to the, produ the producer? I work in, in different, um, with, with different co international corporations, but I think the found that, that the international cooperation has to work in agriculture need to guarantee go directly to the farmers. Because when you study the percent of the amount, the big amount, who, what, what is in the, in the farm, in the farm level, is a low percentage, I guarantee. So continue in the future. I think we have a big challenge, but I need to be, I need, I, I think we need to scale, but with experience, with, with projects, like we call projects, but maybe it's not a, you know that, that the international word to say, but it's like a, you know, projects, implementation, a work plan. This like a, we need to implement the action that we are discussing in our workshops. So um, Coronivia need to be more and more used forever in the climate change convention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Carla, and especially for uh, bringing the Costa Rica perspective to all of us and also showing how the work we are doing here links to what happens in Costa Rica. Thank you very much. And before going to the third speaker, I would like to remind all of you that at the end of the session, we have a Q&A. So I invite all of you already to think of questions for that to one of our speakers and also to our virtual participants, of course, uh, to raise questions. And you can also do that in the chat box. That brings me to the third speaker of tonight. Um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce to you uh, Veronica Ndetu from Kenya. Veronica, the floor is yours. No, it's already there. It's, thank you. Um, um, the experiences from all the lessons that we have learned from the Coronivia process. Um, as the process started and as we come towards the end of this process, uh, it is good to acknowledge or we uh, learned that um, there is quite plenty of uh, information uh, from the presentations that were made by the experts, presentations made by the constituted bodies, presentations made even by the parties themselves on what is happening, the technologies, the innovations, and the practices that are happening in different places gave us an impression that if we were to implement all this that is happening in various uh, segregated areas, then the dream of the coronavia uh, would be achieved. So then the question remains, how do we uh, uh, make that happen? So really the kind of experience we have had uh, through uh, ensuring that all the topics that of discussion under the coronavia joint work on agriculture, we had at least experiences happening in uh, one place or another, or organizations uh, that have been implementing, countries that have been implementing. Uh, our constituent bodies have also have had experiences in different areas. And so that tells us that there is plenty that we need to exchange, even as we advance the coronavirus uh, uh, towards the, the other end now of implementation, we have actually plenty that we have to implement. We only need to ensure that we scale it up. Uh, a lot of work went into that, uh, into the, into the, into the works, and I think it is good to appreciate that, um, as much as all of us may differ in opinion, in the way we express ourselves, in the way we uh, define things, but uh, the less one of the lessons we could we need to learn here is that um, a lot of us, all of us, had the goodwill and. Uh, the spirit to advance the issues of agriculture within the UNFCC. And uh, we, are, we in Kenya are happy to see that uh, uh, really that uh, was, is the spirit. Um, the other thing that uh, I would say that uh, we learned is that um, uh, the, the, the countries, the parties, the observers, um, express their wishes, or if I should call them wishes, but maybe their, their perceptions in the way they would want uh, issues of agriculture implemented. And they, those also are contained in the submissions that uh, we all made, uh, saying, how do we need, how, how do we foresee uh, the coronavia being implemented? How do we fo foresee the coronavia progress? And so there is another wealth of experience from uh, all the submissions that gives us uh, an indication of what we, where we all want to go. And I think it is good that uh, we really uh, delve into that and look at um, what it is. And then I, I don't think we really need to bother again to look for what we need to do, because it's all there in all the submissions we made, all the uh, workshop reports that we have had. As has been said, uh, looking at yesterday's outcome is that um, we have 
uh, had a very, um, a very uh, detailed kind of discussions, the reports of which are also contained in our uh, or in the Coronavia um, uh, roadmap and discussions. Then, um, uh, what we would say is that uh, as the Coronavia roadmap gets to its end, um, of course, the push and has been said by my uh, the earlier speakers is that uh, to see the implementation take place. The, the anticipation of uh, all of us, particularly those of us in the developed, developing uh, countries is that uh, all things that we are saying, all these things that we have been saying in these uh, workshops uh, are better at the farm level, are better off with the farmers. And because much as we, as we continue to discuss, still the farmers face uh, the impacts of climate change, they continue, their vulnerabilities continue increasing, and it may not really uh, be, uh, this is just not the end, but the beginning. The discussions and uh, what we need to do, the end of the roadmap, now is the beginning of our farmers seeing uh, what it is that we have been discussing, seeing the, uh, the, the results of these discussions going to them and so that they can actually benefit from all these discussions that we have been having. And even if we, we, we say that, whichever the outcome that we get, because we are going to get an outcome, and I believe we are going to get a very favorable outcome, gauging from the positive um, indications that all the parties are expressing in the Coronavia uh, family, uh, but these outcomes, uh, the good language that we have been uh, uh, crafting uh, day in, day out, and using very long hours, that good language is not useful if it is not <laughs> experienced by the farmer. And if it doesn't transform our farming systems, our food systems into something that is uh, useful to us, I mean, to, and uh, to, of course, us, we are included because even if we are not farmers, we are consumers. We are all dependent on the farmer. So really these things we need to take into consideration that um, implementation is key. And this is why then we have been talking about, um, uh, since Coronavia is the only program under which agriculture is discussed within the, within the UNFCC, then what we need to be able to acknowledge is that uh, it's good to have a, a decision, a UNFCC decisions, if really we want to look at agriculture, or take agriculture as seriously as it is uh, within the UNFCC, so that then we can be able to ensure that there is implementation. So we, we require a COP decision uh, that would be able to uh, ensure that there is fast tracking of implementation of the outcomes of the coronavirus uh, work uh, because we need to enhance the resilience of the farmers so that doesn't re um, remain a discussion. We need to ensure that our farming systems are responsive to the uh, impacts of climate change. We need to ensure that agriculture continues uh, doing what it ought to be, providing food security. Agriculture needs to adapt to climate change and agriculture also needs like to do that in a slow carbon manner as possible. And so uh, all these discussions that we have been had, all the approaches that we have been, uh, um, that have come into the flow, the agroecology, the CSA, and all the other approaches that are really necessary to ensure that there is increased productivity, and also we are uh, enhancing the resilience of our production systems that need to be able to uh, get into, um, uh, be implemented. We need to remove the barriers uh, to access of the appropriate climate uh, technologies. Uh, these technologies, as we have said, we, we really discussed a lot of things, and I know uh, there is a real world of experience, and others that were not even discussed in the coronavirus. But uh, 
do farmers access them? What can we do to ensure that uh, the barriers to uh, access to these technologies and innovations are available to the farmers in the different areas? Because we still need to reduce the poverty that our farmers suffer, and we need to be able to empower our farmers to actively engage in climate action so that they are also aware that the climate is changing and whatever they do they ensure that they are responsive to the climate change we also need to enhance the, capa the capacities uh, of the extension providers uh, knowledge generation also and we also to need to ensure that there is proper dissemination of whatever technologies and practices that are existing and that requires scaling up of the best practices that we have been discussing. So this, again, uh, just like my colleagues have said, requires international cooperation. It requires a lot of capacity building uh, at um, uh, regional, national, and the very local level. And again, uh, we uh, require technical support because um, like uh, I've just said that a lot of the discussions like they are happening in some place by uh, being implemented by certain experts, being implemented by uh, certain organizations, but then they are not all over. So we need to be able to validate these uh, technologies, these practices in the various areas and be able to uh, scale them up for implementation in the specific areas based on the circumstances of each one of our countries and each one of our uh, local circumstances. Then the, that, of course, will not happen when there is no financial support. Because how do we scale up? How do we uh, move? I mean, how do we move the technologies from the, 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 the documents and take, make them uh, ha happen practically at the farm level? We, we will require financial support that countries also need, countries, sorry, need also to be able to identify the key areas of the, uh, uh, the key implementation areas uh, based on their own uh, circumstances, based on their own priorities, so that we can be able to then uh, base uh, our requests uh, or our requirements for support on this uh, kind of um, uh, our needs, uh, so, so that uh, uh, as we move towards um, implementation, it is going to move from uh, general discussion to specific discussions that include what do countries want to do, what do uh, organizations want to do. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Veronica, for this perspective from Kenya and also again mentioning which has been mentioned before the spirit to advance which we have seen last week and also afterwards mentioning especially bringing what we discuss here to the farmers um, that brings me to our last speaker of tonight um, it's an honor for me to present to you Mrs. Prijambada Joshi from Nepal the floor is yours again You hear me? Thank you so much. Thank you, organizer, for providing me this opportunity to, to present my views, my, my perspectives, and uh, to represent Nepal in front of Korinivia family. So I feel so fortunate that I'm, can I say it? <laughs> uh, I feel fortunate that um, I'm here to represent my country. So how I will present is, uh, I, I will not like to repeat what, how, how our negotiation went and what, what kind of discussion we had and what we, what we learned through all the process. Uh, I would just like to present in short uh, national perspective, perspective of Nepal uh, regarding Coronivia, uh, KZWA. So, you know, Nepal, in Nepal, uh, the weather pattern is drastically changing and the agriculture sector is the first uh, to get hit uh, because, um, uh, because uh, uh, our livelihood depends on agriculture. 
most of the population, like uh, more than one third of the population is dependent on agriculture and, um, and uh, agriculture contribute 27% of our GDP. So it is very important for us to respond to the climate change related hazards in agriculture. Uh, yeah, and, and I want to say that climate change is not the challenge, challenge for the future, but uh, it's, it's, it's a problem uh, we are currently facing. So, uh, so it needs urgent and immediate response. So, uh, but uh, you know, agriculture, uh, agriculture is often overlooked in climate change uh, discussion. That is what I feel. So thankfully we have KZWA, the KZWA initiative uh, starts uh, from COP23. So we, we already have six, had six workshops since then. And uh, in, uh, back to Nepal, uh, we, we need to produce more and better, more and better. Uh, like uh, we, need to, we need to have more production with you know, limited available input and limited water available. So for this government and, uh, uh, and uh, other stakeholders, concerned stakeholders, they are, uh, they are working on it. They are, they are addressing climate change through their policies and program, but uh, the work coverage is so very, very much low, I must say. Uh, some some projects are just the piloting kind of projects, so it needs to scale up. And um, uh, it's not that we haven't identified the technologies that can address climate change hazards. We have we have in different uh, uh, different piloting projects uh, through, by the government, um, by by other stakeholders. But what we need is again we need uh, to scaling up. Uh, scaling up the uh, technologies which have already proven uh, proven successful in the local scenario. So I want to put forth that um, put forth the idea that we need resources. We need resources so that the maximum farmers, uh, I must say, all the farmers can get benefited. So our stake, Nepal's stake regarding KJWA is. Yeah, it should be, it should be, you know, it should be continued and established as a constituted body or committee under the, under the convention so that uh, more bold and transformative interventions can be done. And uh, yeah, we require long-term financial support that I, I, you know, which I already discussed as any other LDC countries. And uh, yeah, technology development and transfer, capacity enhancement, scaling up the technologies, those are our, these are our priorities. Uh, Nepal uh, has, uh, as I said, Nepal has started some initiatives like uh, climate smart agriculture and uh, agro, agro advisory services, um, ETC. So again, the scaling up is, uh, is the issue here. So, Future topic we want to include uh, like a nature-based solution for the mountain ecosystem. We have it. So uh, these are the. Th this is the first uh, future topic Nepal recognized, uh, and the second is scaling up the proven technologies, research and development of the technologies. Now, for example, development of the varieties for the. Um, for example, development of rice varieties. Rice is our uh, main uh, food crop. So we face uh, different problems uh, in rice crop, like sometimes submergence during the heavy rainfall or sometimes uh, some drought. So the development of the, the submergence resistant varieties or maybe the drought resistant varieties, the kind, the, those kind of technologies. and. Uh, one important issue is the human resource experts in climate change, both in research and extension. So we need to build a critical mass of the experts in research and extension both. 
So uh, the finally, I would like to say the work done by Sobstra and SBI and KZW is appreciable, of course. Um, and progress regarding workshop went well. Uh, though Nepal would like to see the result in the ground, in the ground, in the farmer's level. So implementing workshop outcomes, you know, taking into the consideration of nascent specific circumstances. I must say nascent spe specific circumstances because uh, like, um, like uh, I think almost uh, all of you were in the negotiation over there uh, past few days. Uh, when we were going word by word, like uh, because we all have our own priorities, um, as um, LDCs, we 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 were really concerned about the word mitigation, which was uh, yeah, like there. So 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 uh, so so we we the consideration to the nation specific circumstances is must as agriculture system is varied and Nepal as LDC, we have subsistence level of farmers. So, um, so the uh, strategies for adaptation, mitigation and resilience um, also vary for um, uh, the varied circumstances uh, in different countries. Uh, and the negotiation of COP26 is uh, done. Hopefully, uh, in uh, COP27, we will get, uh, we'll, uh, we will, uh, we will come up with uh, similar or say same, um, same understanding, and we will move towards the same direction with the help of other supporting uh, organizations as well, and uh, we will see the action in the ground to the farmers level that is what we are really waiting for uh, otherwise uh, just doing workshop and finding out issues and discussing does not help much so this is what i like to say from Nepal. thank you thank you, so you very much. much thank you very much for the final intervention and i think we went a bit over time but i think we're also here with a group of people who's used to sit in a room and talk for hours and hours. So I think we managed quite well to do it within this timing. Thank you very much, everyone. These are wonderful contributions by all of you. Thank you very much. That brings us to the final part, which is the Q&A session. I'm not sure if there are any questions coming in. I see one a hand raised over here. So uh, the floor is yours. No. I cannot hear you. Yeah. Hello? Hello? Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, that's good. A lot of suspense with my question. Thank you for waiting. So I have a question about the future of Corinivia. And this year we had the Food System Summit, and currently the Corinivia Joint Work on Agriculture is, as the name suggests, focused on agriculture. So I'm wondering whether there's been any consideration of having a more food system focused platform at the UNFCCC, whether that is Corinivia or something else that extends beyond agriculture to also include food loss and wastes and diets as considerations at the UNFCCC. So I'm just wondering if this is something that is being considered or discussed or what um, the negotiators here and others think about such a proposal. Thank you for your question. Is there anyone specific who you would like to ask that question? One of the four speakers, for example. Anybody that would like to answer it. Anybody would like to answer? Okay, thank you. Is, is anybody willing to answer this question? Does anybody have any views on that? Valerie? So, oh, we can answer jointly with, uh, with Carla. We have it two times in our SB conclusion. I suppose you have read it and you know it by heart. <laughs> we have sustainable food production system and food system in our conclusion. So it's really something, yes, that 
that is quite also mainstream now to to have a global view uh, because it's uh voila it's uh, quite common now to 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 realize that we need to have the global view and so in the food system you have loss and waste you have the consumption you have everything and and something to to i like to add is we remark that the, that is the food system or sustainable food production system, like uh, we mentioned in our in our document, is uh, is recognizing like a priority. We recognize it like a priority, fundamental priority, and also we recognize it that it is urgent to to um, to include it in our climate change dimension in agriculture. So it's included. It's in our hands. It's in our documents and it's in, in our um, responsibility too. And there is also food and nutrition security yes, two times. Too. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Uh, any addition, Veronica or, no, yes? Uh, uh, thank you. I think uh, oh, uh, the question is also like, uh, uh, anything that is not covered within the coronavia as you may want to have it, uh, there has been the call uh, as we go into the future, uh, the future topics. If, uh, of course, observers and uh, parties have, uh, have be, had been asked to to make their recommendations on what they think is not within the topics that have been discussed, that they can can be included in the future topics. Uh, I guess that window is still there, so <laughs> we can still have a, a topics that you think are seriously missing in the in the in the discussions and then they could be included for future topics and that then would mean uh when the decision is finally made in cop 27 the issue of uh how what is the future for coronavia needs then to include that discussions you need to continue because the topics are not exhausted exhaustive thank you thank you very much i hope that answers the question Perfect. If I'm looking on the to the online questions and Marcel helped me a bit with that, we saw one question coming in on the fact that some might be afraid that agriculture might not be on the agenda again or that it's a topic which is forgotten if we look to climate change, especially um, questions to the speakers we've had today. Uh, how do you think that observers, for example, can advocate that that agriculture stays an agenda item? if we look to climate change. Do you have any, any reflections on that? It, it can be also other negotiators in the, in the room. Huh? There are many in the room. <laughs> how, how they can make sure that, that agriculture remains on the agenda here? So that we do not lose this topic. They can make submissions at any time and uh, say that it's really a priority and even give their more specific priorities. And they usually express also in the rooms during the informal uh, sessions, during the plenaries. I think they can express easily. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. I hope that answers the questions. Thank you. Uh, I want to <laughs> just add that. Okay, I take the mic. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I just want to add that uh, agriculture should remain on the agenda, but I think there is need to recognize that agriculture happens way back down there on the ground and that how to recognize it at the international process like this requires that, uh, that there is a, an organic link. There is voices from out there, there are best practices from down there that inform global processes such as this one. My thinking is that it is important that as we think in moving forward, it is uh, necessary that we have that interaction and we get the farmers to play a role in informing this process. And I think it has been made clear by many speakers here that we need to get these ideas 
tested by farmers and let them respond. And I think this is a challenge that I push to, particularly FAO has convened us. How do we try to have this interaction uh, in order to make it relevant and in order to make it easier for the observers and the civil society to appreciate that, yes, what we are seeing on the ground is what is being mentioned here. And I think this is the reality of what we want to see uh, coming out of the negotiations and also the stakeholders being part of it and not just negotiators talking about themselves, governments talking about themselves. How do we get the practical reality of these ideas being tested, being uh, um, you know, provided uh, by lessons from the ground? And uh, my view is that uh, we would like to recognize the national circumstances the divide between uh, developed country farmers and least developed country farmers. We are arguing about mitigation and adaptation, but we are just talking about words. But the farmers who are affected and who are causing this are not here. They are not, their voices are not being heard. Their situation is not being projected directly. And I think this is what we need to, to solve in order to enhance agriculture in the whole negotiation process and see that uh, the clear picture is, is put forward. Thank you. Say your name and your country. Stephen Mwaya from Uganda. Thank you. Negotiator. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm looking around. Any more questions? Yes, over here. Marcel? Two questions too. Oh, super. Um, so partly to what you were saying just there, um, how do you see Coronavia acting to hold the largest polluters accountable in agriculture through mitigation while not impacting those that are not causing as much um, it, like emissions or impact on the landscape like, and more pushing them towards adaptation? How do you draw that boundary? Um, or how do you not hold someone accountable to mitigate when they're not having that much impact? Thank you. Is, do you want to respond to that question or someone else? Veronica, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, just like in any of the other negotiations, and I think uh, here every speaker that has spoken has talked about national circumstances. And this is what um, uh, holds everyone responsible for their actions. So that if uh, you are a major emitter in your agriculture, then your activities, and that's why we, we, we don't become so pres prescriptive to every nation that we have to do the, uh, uh, this. It is that uh, every, every nation ha needs to do uh, the activities uh, in agriculture that ensure that in, in addition to increasing productivity and resilience uh, to the agriculture systems, you are reducing emissions. Of course, reducing those emissions will be based on how much are you emitting already on, or how much are you not, so that those of the countries that are not emitting much, then still ensure that they do not increase their emissions as they produce. But again, those countries that are also emitting uh, a lot, they ensure also, because they still have to produce for their, uh, uh, their population, but again, they still also need to address the emissions. So, so really, it's, it's an issue of where are you and where do you want to go? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Veronica. Um, we're passing time, but John, I saw you had one more question. Is it a, no? Okay. Go ahead if you want to, as a final one. Yeah, my name is Jon Magnar Haugen. I'm from Norway, so I was also involved in the negotiations. And I think, I think the reflection from Veronica to the question was, was um, relevant. This is this is not the place for litigation or for to uh, to to hold uh, 
uh, to hold like the, the, the world holds anybody to account this is not the place for that so this is a, a party driven process where we must try to make our part and take our um as a as a party as a country we must we must um involve with each other and and live up to our responsibilities uh, and that is how it works uh, when it comes to whether there is a chance that agriculture is left out of the agenda and that's um, when i raise my hand um i think <laughs> there shall be a uh, very good good arguments to leave leave it out of the of the unf triple c uh, actually it is recognized already in the in the um, main objectives of the you know, of the convention and also uh, in the paragraph th two of the convention and also in paragraph two of the paris agreement as one of the one of the central objectives that we join forces to to control climate change that is actually to maintain food security as an indispensable issue for all humanity so so obviously food security the and and therefore also agriculture is all actually at the core why we are here that we want to still have our home in agriculture so that is a response to that thank you john and I think that's also a very beautiful remark to end with this session. Um, it's already 7.30, so thank you very much all of you for being here and especially a, a, a big thanks to all of the speakers we had today. Um, so perhaps one other round of applause for them and then we're all good to go, I would say. Thank you very much.